Welcome to the presentation. I'll get started here in just one second. All right, so um, today we're going to talk about uh, when you don't have a CISO. <laughs> so uh, if you're able to um, uh, just think to yourself, uh, you know, I, we don't normally I would go for a show of hands, but I'm not going to try and get too technical here. But, uh, you know, just uh, for, for anyone watching, um, you know, if you do have a CISO in your organization, that's great. If you are a CISO, great. Hopefully you can learn a few things. Uh, but one thing that we're going to try and cover today is uh, just kind of covering, um, you know, some pitfalls to avoid uh, if you don't have a CISO and how you can uh, work your way towards building a strong security program. Uh, so again, I'm not going to, I'm trying, I'm not going to try and be too technical here and, and uh, try a poll or anything, but um, you know, just to kind of a few questions to kind of get you started. Um, you know, you you might be in the right room or virtual room if you can't describe your information security policy. Uh, if you don't know who's responsible for information security in your organization, or maybe you're someone like your IT director is, but he's focused more on just technical things and keeping the lights on. Uh, maybe you've had a breach, or you're concerned about having a breach, and you just you don't know what you don't know. You're like, what? what do I need to be doing uh, to prepare? And uh, that might be keeping you up at night. Or you just want to know more about what a CISO is and, and determine if you need one. Uh, just to set the level straight, um, uh, definition of a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. So my name is Adam Kaler. Uh, I'm actually director of our uh, risk security and privacy healthcare services at Online Business Systems. Uh, so what I do is uh, within our risk security and privacy practice, which spans a lot of different areas, uh, I focus strictly on healthcare and uh, working with healthcare organizations, both in Canada and the US to ensure that they are putting proper security controls in place, security uh, programs, meeting their regulatory contractual requirements and things like that. Uh, I, I'm currently in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but I will attest that I am a, a Manitoba boy, um, and I've spent the better uh, the first 30 uh, of my best years in Winnipeg and, and the Winnipeg area. Um, so I do spend a lot of time uh, talking with organizations in Canada and the US uh, just about the kind of questions that you might have today. Uh, I do virtual CISO services for a few uh, organizations and we have other people on our team who do the same. A little bit about online business systems. Uh, you may have heard of us, uh, hopefully you have, uh, but uh, in case you haven't, we've been around since 1986, founded in Winnipeg by, um, you know, Chuck Lowen, uh, who you see there, um, a University of Manitoba grad. Uh, we have over 350 professionals in Canada, the US. Um, we, most of our clients are, are in Canada, the US. We do both digital transformation and cybersecurity. And, uh, and at times we, we're lucky enough to be able to pair those two together to provide uh, secure digital transformation uh, projects. So here are a few things we're going to talk about today. Uh, I, want, I want to talk about some trends in healthcare. Oh, sorry, you know, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to defer to healthcare, though I'm going to try and keep this generic. Trends in cybersecurity. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what are some of the pitfalls when you don't have a CISO in your organization? And uh, what are the things to kind of, you know, watch out for or things that can, can kind of uh, trap you? And then uh, we're going to talk about a little bit what a CISO does. What is a chief information security officer, and, and you know why why is this even important? And then we're going to go one step further and say what does a VCISO do, do? And that's a virtual CISO, and that's something that online business systems does. And then you know hopefully at the end we'll have a little bit of time for Q and A. So let's start with some trends. Uh, if you've been watching the news at all uh, in the past week, and, and, and I usually like to do this in my presentations, is, is start with some, some, uh, some hot topics, things in the news, and things that you can really relate to. 
And fortunately or unfortunately in cybersecurity, there's usually a big breach or you know, something in the past week uh, that everybody's talking about. And I, it's unfortunate that these breaches are that frequent, but it is almost without fail uh, something I can refer to in my, in my um, presentations. And we heard a bit about it this morning in the keynote, um, which was really interesting. And, and certainly that's you know, ransomware. And uh, here in the U.S. with uh, the pipeline uh, breach that was, uh, you know, a ransomware attack on, on the corporate systems, uh, fortunately not on their operational systems. But uh, it seems that, uh, you know, it's, it's pervasive these days, unfortunately, that, that ransomware is just um, affecting companies of all shapes and sizes, any industry. Uh, where I work in healthcare, it's especially rampant. And unfortunately, in healthcare, the reason for that is, be, you know, partly because it's it's a very target-rich environment. Uh, the value of healthcare records is really high, and unfortunately, the level of security sophistication in the industry is pretty low. So you've got a high-value target with low maturity of security controls. It's almost a, a perfect storm. So when I'm talking to health centers uh, across the country in the U.S. Uh, either they've been hit by a ransomware attack or the, the hospital down the street has been almost without fail. So uh, what we're seeing in organizations is they say, you know, what, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to protect against ransomware? And they, and they really don't even, sometimes don't even know where to start. Where, and they're looking for a, a silver bullet, which really doesn't exist. You know, all these things are really um, a function of having just a proper mature security program in place and not only protecting against this thing happening, but preparing for the eventuality of when it does happen. So the interesting thing is um, most organizations and enterprises and CISOs these days say, yeah, I'm going to spend time protecting against, um, against threats, but I'm going to spend just as much time preparing for when it will happen, not if. And that way, when it does happen, uh, an organization is much more prepared to respond appropriately, um, get uh, remediated quicker. And the quicker you can be on top of something and respond, the quicker you can be back in action. So, you know, for example, I don't know anything about, you know, the, the pipeline breach uh, this last week, but perhaps if they had spent more time on incident response and preparedness, uh, you know, they, they may have been back up in a day or two instead of, you know, something that looks like it might go on for a week or more. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of ransomware, uh, top of everyone's mind. Phishing attacks, these two things often go together. Often phishing is the precursor to ransomware. Uh, but as, as long as we have people clicking on links, we're going to have phishing attacks. Um, a, a few other things we're seeing is an increased reliance on third parties. More and more, your information security program isn't about protecting the things inside your castle walls. It's about making sure that the people that you're handing control over to are also protecting the information. We've got so many more cloud-based systems and vendors and contractors and things like this. And that's where we often see the breaches occur, not within the things that you can control, but out there with your third parties. And guess what? Their breach is your breach if it's your information. And so organizations are having to spend a lot more time just kind of managing their vendors and their third parties than they are even on managing their own thing. And that you know, really requires a certain level of expertise. And, that, and then we have this explosion of consumer apps. We've got, we've got especially like in healthcare again, uh, we've got so many more con, uh, consumers or uh, patients or you know, other people grabbing this data, pulling it down on their phones, sharing it and using third party apps and all these things. And it's really becoming difficult to manage all this information. It's not just about um, you know, locking down your firewall and, and uh, your active directory and things like that anymore. Uh, managing your in the security of your information is really, uh, has really changed into much more of a program level task than a technical one. <clears throat> So here's the challenge when, when you don't have a VC. So, and again, I don't, you know, we have people here representing all different industries, shapes and sizes of companies. And so this stuff may resonate differently with you. Some of these things may be applicable, some things maybe not, but hey, we'll shoot through them and hopefully something will, uh, will, will resonate with you. <clears throat> so here's, here's one of the biggest challenges I see in organizations. 
you may have some kind of regulatory or contractual requirement to have a security officer, someone designated as responsible for security. In my experience, for most small to medium-sized organizations, this person falls into one of two buckets. The first bucket is uh, they designate someone that's maybe an operations manager, maybe the CIO, uh, or even the CEO as the security officer. The buck stops here, they're responsible for security. And, um, you know, it, that's, that's great. Sure, the buck stops there, but they don't really have the expertise to know what it is they are managing. Uh, you know, I, I've, I know some great people who are CEOs and they're really smart and great business people, but they may not have the expertise in information security that's required of someone to really understand how are we um, maintaining our information security compliance, uh, how are we, you know, how, how, what's our risk management program look like and how are we managing, detecting and managing our security risks and things like that. So it really becomes uh, a challenge for them. And often it's like the third hat they're wear, wearing. Maybe they're the CEO and like two other things. And oh, by the way, you're also the security officer. Well, guess what? If that's the case, the information security, security program isn't getting the time and attention it deserves uh, when it's just kind of the, an extra hat that someone's wearing. The other bucket I see uh, in most of these organizations is they say, well, security is an IT problem. So let's make our, uh, our IT manager, you're the security officer. You're responsible for locking down the firewalls and doing the antivirus and patching and all that stuff. Let's put security there. And while all those things are uh, very important security tasks, the security is much broader than just locking down firewalls and making sure things are patched and, and doing antivirus. Um, information security requires an understanding of a business and, and risk. And being able to say, okay, where's our information? How is it flowing? What are the threats to that information? Where are we vulnerable? And therefore, what's the risk? And then when you can understand the risk, then you can start to manage it in a certain way. So you're not just going to the, the CFO and saying, well, I need $100,000 for a, you know, an IDS IPS solution. You're saying, you're able to say, okay, here's our risk. And here are our top risks, and here, here, are the threat, here are the controls that we can use to address them, and, and here's the cost for that, versus here are the consequences if we don't. So what you can start to do as, uh, as a, a CISO, as opposed to strictly an IT person, is you can start to speak the language of the business. And you can start to go to your board and your executives and whoever else is asking and speak their language and say, okay, you know, here, here's our business risk. Uh, I heard a very smart individual once say, there's no such thing as security risk, there's only business risk. So security risk in and of itself isn't, isn't really a thing. Uh, what the risk is, is we may have downtime, we may have information exposure, we may have fines and liability. Those are the things that we're protecting against. And when, if, if you're not able to speak that language, you're really doing yourself a disservice because that's when you get into just buying the next shiny thing and it really doesn't help your organization. So the next challenge, as I mentioned, uh, boards of directors are paying attention. They read the news, they see this, this pipeline uh, ransomware attack uh, that's going on in the US, and then they start to go to their or own organization and say, what kind of risk are we incurring? And they start to ask some hard questions. And if you come back with, oh, we need a new firewall, that doesn't really answer the question. The question needs to be, what's our exposure to ransomware? And I, I, I apologize for the typo in the ransomware there. Um, what's our exposure to ransomware? What are the impacts to our organization if it does occur? So maybe we get affected by ransomware, but because it's you know, on this separated system that uh, is totally non-operational and uh, maybe it's just our marketing website, uh, the impact might be pretty low. If our operational systems get affected, then it's a different story. So that's the kind of questions that, that they're asking. They're not, they're not asking what, you know, what security controls do I need or what, what technical things do I need to put in place to protect against this? They want to say, what's our exposure? What's going to happen if it does occur? And how do I protect against it? They also want to know, uh, what's our exposure to breach in general? And how do I know if I've had a breach? And what happens if we have a breach? And 
you know, for example, um, you know, here, here in the US with, with HIPAA, people are worried about having breaches, notably, but it's also important to recognize that if you do the things ahead of time, like the compliance tasks, the the day-to-day -day security tasks, and then you have a breach, you're in a much better place uh, in regards to fines and liability and things like that than if than if you just had the breach and and didn't do all those things. Because where you see the fines and liability is if you show willful neglect. And if you don't have a proper security program in place that doesn't match up with your peers, then you, then you may be showing willful neglect and you could be in a very poor position when the auditors and the lawyers come asking. Um, here's another thing that, that I often see, especially because we do a lot of security assessment. So you just had a security risk assessment or maybe you just had an audit against some kind of standard and you've got a whole bunch of gaps or ri risks or gaps or however, however they put it. And you go, now what? So again, often what I see is this report gets shipped over to the IT director. And I don't mean to denigrate IT directors in this uh, presentation. <laughs> if you are one, I'm, you, you know, may, there are IT directors out there who have great information security background, can do both, understand both, and, um, and, and are able to do that job. And so, you know what, I, I'll recognize that, that that is the case a lot of times. But just from my experience, from what I've seen a lot of times, is that this gets pushed toward the IT side, where it really doesn't always belong, especially because a, a good information security program also has ramifications with HR, um, operations, facilities, and touches every other part of the business, including IT. So often it's a bit of a disservice to the IT director to just push, push IT that or push uh, information security that way. But again, what I see is, the audit report gets pushed to the IT director and says, okay, go fix all this stuff. And that person may not be in a position to fix all this stuff because a lot of it may be administrative, like I said, in HR. And I mean, the other thing is that the, the decisions to manage risk are a business decision. And so what you need is someone who can take that and put it in business terms and say, okay, here, here's the impact to the business. Here are our highest risks as far as impact. And therefore, here's how we should prioritize our remediation plans. We can't just go and do, do everything. So we really have to be able to prioritize and manage it. And that's what a good uh, CISO can do. All right, again, you may have compliance requirements. You know what? Almost every organization has compliance requirements. In, in today's regulatory uh, and compliance framework, um, it's hard for me to think of an organization that doesn't have to comply with something, whether it be PCI DSS because you're handling credit cards, um, you know, FIPA, FIA, PIPA, if you're in the healthcare industry or even not in the healthcare industry, if you're handling consumer information, uh, you have a, a legal requirement to protect that information and there's standards for that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of organizations that are trying to sell to enterprise customers, the enterprise customer will say, okay, show me your SOC 2 report, show me your ISO certification. And that brings with it, you know, all of its own types of things. In healthcare, uh, in the US, we have HIPAA. Um, in in uh, Canada, you have FIA and, and things like that. So everyone has compliance requirements. And again, if you're just putting this on the side of the desk who someone for someone who normally does something else, your chances of actually following through with your compliance requirements are actually pretty low. So again, you've, you've had a breach. Uh, I actually just before this got off of a call with an organization that came to us and said, okay, we have a part of our organization that had a breach. Um, what do we do now? And unfortunately, that is not the time to ask the question. The time to ask that question was a year ago before you had the breach <laughs> and being able to say, not if we have a breach, but when we have a breach, what do we need to do to be prepare, prepared? The first time you go through your incident response process should not be after the breach occurred. Uh, your chances of success are pretty low if, if that's the case. So what you wanna make sure is beforehand, you actually have this plan in place and you've exercised the plan, you've walked through it, you've done tabletop exercises. You've said, okay, in the event of this, you know, what's our communication plan? Who's making the decisions? Who made that decision 
to turn off the pipeline because it, it actually wasn't the pipeline operation systems that were breached, it was the corporate systems. So the pipe, pipeline could have been fully operational, uh, but they decided as a precautionary task to take down the pipeline operation systems. Who is responsible for making that decision? So all these things need to be carved out ahead of time. And what most people find out is that breach response is much less about um, doing the forensics and, and the, the technical tasks as it is administrative. Who's making decisions? How are you communicating within the organization? How are you making sure the wrong message doesn't get out, outside of the organization? And, and who, who's involved in that decision-making process? And I've been through a few of these tabletop exercises with organizations and you, you see that light bulb go off, right? You get about 10 minutes into it and they go, and, and the, you know, you'll, you'll have people sitting around the table, one's the CEO, the CIO, and, and the, the IT director. And all of a sudden you'll find that the IT director is sitting there all quiet because the decisions being made are not necessarily technical. So that, that's a really good uh, type, type of way to actually learn about this and, and how you're gonna respond is doing those tabletop exercises. That's something, you know, a CISO will, will be a really good person for coordinating and making sure that, um, a, a, making sure it happens, but also making sure the organization prepared for when that breach occurs. Um, okay, I mean, th this is almost the same as the last slide. <laughs> this is, you failed an audit, now what? And the time to ask that question was before the audit, not after, but it happens and here you are, and now what do we do? So, whether it was you know, a prospective client doing their due diligence, uh, doing a vendor audit, uh, maybe it was a certification, maybe it was a regulatory audit, uh, you know, you, and generally they're not pass, a pass fail. Often an audit is, okay, here we have a bunch of findings, let's work together to remediate them. But regardless of how it comes back, there was some sort of audit, it came back with findings, and now you wanna be able to demonstrate to whoever it is that you're doing your work to, um, to put in proper information security controls. And again, it's being able to talk the language, to understand what reasonable security controls are and being able to negotiate that and put together that plan to be able to get to a spot where you don't fail the audit the next time around. Uh, we, we always say in, uh, in our, our program that um, compliance is actually a byproduct of a good security program. So you shouldn't be chasing that compliance tail. You shouldn't be saying, okay, here's this compliance requirement. Let's do the things we need to do to, to meet these, per these items. What you should be doing is putting together a comprehensive security program so that when the compliance requirement does come along, you're probably 90 to 95% of the way there. It's really just kind of connecting the dots. Uh, most compliance requirements will have some things that are unique that you go, have to go, okay, you know, whatever it is. You know, for example, I know, I happen to know that in Israel, you have to register all of your databases. If you have a database with client inf or uh, um, citizen information, you have to register with the government. So, you know, that's, that's one thing very unique to there. And everyone will have its own unique things. Um, but if you have that proper information security program in place, uh, the delta between where you are and what you need to do to get to compliance is generally very small. I'm actually, I'm gonna take a, take a quick pause here for a second and see if there's any questions in the chat. If I can find the chat. Okay, I don't see any open questions. Feel free to post them in there as I'm talking. And, uh, and I'll, I'll get to them as I uh, am able. All right, let's back up a little bit. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, I, I've kind of, uh, spun around on a few common themes here. Uh, kind of the main one is that if you really want to have a chance of putting in a proper information security program, uh, you, <laughs> you kind of need to, you know, have, have someone who, um, who has experience in this area. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I tried to do my own plumbing last week and, uh, you know, it, it didn't go well. 
uh, and then, you know, you call the plumber and he goes, oh, well, yeah, you need to, you need a PVC and, and galvanized pipe over here and do that. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I totally didn't know that. So it, it's a little bit of like, you don't know what you don't know. And so by bringing in someone with that expertise, uh, they can make it run a lot, a lot more smoothly, can bring in the things that need to be brought in and also can, can be a gauge of like, hey, maybe we don't need that big shiny new thing. Maybe what's reasonable and appropriate for this organization is this other kind of smaller thing over here. And maybe one day we'll grow up to that bigger thing. But by making those kinds of decisions and figuring out what reasonable and appropriate security controls are for this organization, you may be able to actually save yourself a lot of money spending spent on technologies that you know either you don't need or actually aren't providing a lot of benefit for your organization. And that's a lot of times where I see organizations do that. Uh, again, if they have a, a compliance requirement um, that, you know, that they do you know, a certain thing, like maybe it's monitoring. So they go out and they spend this money on this monitoring platform that just does everything. And uh, you know, it's designed for an enterprise and it's just really a lot more than the organization needs when really they should just be focusing on monitoring this piece. Uh, so uh, we do have a question. It's what, what do you think is a typical security budget spend annually for a medium-sized company? Uh, for example, 250 employees. And, you know, I, I really hate to be uh, that security guy who comes back with this answer, but uh, the, the, the big answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason I say that is because it really depends on what industry you're in. Uh, you know, if, if you're, um, uh, I don't want to give an example of, of an industry that one of you might be in, because then you might think that, you know, I, I think less of it. But if you're in an industry that doesn't have a lot of compliance requirements, and you're not handling a lot of sensitive information, then your security budget will be less. Uh, if you're in an organization such as healthcare, where you've got high value target, um, and if you're a technology company handling a lot of healthcare information, that fits under that umbrella as well. That's uh, where we're seeing a lot of growth. Uh, then, then you're going to be spending more on, on uh, information security. It's also sometimes difficult to isolate the security budget spend because it kind of bleeds into the IT budget, the operational budget, sometimes the, the, over, the administrative budget. So I hate to not answer a question, but I, that's, that's a very difficult one for me to answer. Um, now, now what we do is, and I'll get into the virtual CISO stuff, is for some organizations, it doesn't make sense to go and, and spend a lot of money on a, on a full-time CISO uh, because you, you, have, you don't have the requirement for that level of person full-time. And that's where we'll get into the VCSO stuff. But I want to get back to you. here's here's really what a CISO does. Um, a CISO is really the person who oversees that security program, that risk management program. They can set the strategy and the roadmap for the security program, and kind of kind of uh, kind of you know oversee it. Make sure you're doing your incident response, your disaster recovery planning, making sure you're doing your risk assessments, evaluating new technologies as they come in and ensuring that the organization as, as they change, whether that be organizationally, um, open a new office, implement some new technology, that they are considering the security implication, implications as they go. Security is not, state of security is not a one-time thing, it's an ongoing thing. So you need to have someone that's kind of walking alongside the organization and, and helping them maintain a secure posture. Uh, you, you don't see anywhere in there about uh, implementing antivirus. You don't see configuring firewalls or access controls or multi-factor authentication. All of those things are important. Uh, the role of a CISO is to ensure that those technology things are being implemented appropriately. So where the vCISO, or I'll say the virtual CISO comes in, is being that trusted advisor, again, for that organization that doesn't have the requirement to, uh, to have this high level, uh, C level person um, sitting there and doing this full time, you bring in that trusted advisor that will spend as much time as is needed and provide that expertise, 
but you know, without having to go all the way to um, full-time expertise and, and also providing on-demand. Uh, I do CISO, VCSO services for a client. And one of the great things is that you know, I, don't, I don't have to be able to do everything. Um, I'm really kind of the coordination point. I've got a team of 60 people sitting behind me or sitting alongside me that when I'm like, okay, well, you need security awareness training. Okay, we'll bring in uh, this expertise over here. Or, or um, oh, you need uh, incident response test and tabletop exercises. Great, we've got a guy who's like really good at that. Let's let's bring him in, and and all that sort of thing. So you can really kind of be a coordination point for all those types of of things. And really, again, it's on demand. So it's like, okay, we only have a need for this much. Well, let's just let's just use that much. So that leads me to, you know, what, what can a VC so do? <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story here. Um, and, and this is a client, again, that, that uh, I've worked with for a little over a year. And they came to us and they said, you know what, we're, we're trying to sell to this big, uh, this big uh, enterprise company. And, uh, you know, they like our product. Uh, everything's great. We're, we're a small technology startup, uh, maybe about, you know, 30 or 40 people. And so uh, we've got this great technology. They love it. They want to buy it. But they sent us this huge security questionnaire. Can you help fill it out and make it, you know, and help us pass this security audit? So, so uh, you know, I, so they had this quick ask. So I, you know, came in and said, well, you know, I, I'm going to help you fill this out in the best way we can, but you know, unfortunately, they're asking a lot of questions like, "Do you encrypt data? Do you um, have monitoring in place?" and and all these things, and you guys don't do it, so it's going to be hard to kind of get you there. What what we can do is we can answer this honestly and talk about what the plan is to put these in place. So we went through that and we worked through it, and you know, and and that worked great. And then, um, you know, and then I didn't hear from them for a few months. And then they came back a few months later. They said, we got another security questionnaire. And I said, okay, well, let's go through it. And uh, it was the same questions. And they had to answer no to all the same questions. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you know, I'll help you do this. But you guys really need to fix these things. And so this happened about two or three times. And then finally, they came back and said, oh, we need to be HIPAA compliant. You know, help, help us get there. And so it after going through this about three or four times, actually after the first time, but they started to listen after about the third time, I said, we really need to not just chase these questionnaires. We need to put in a security program that will help us be ready for when all of these different requirements come. So we did that. We, we signed, they signed up, uh, you know, virtual CISO subscription. We started to work through what all the needs were, put a timeline on them and just track them and prioritize them and things like that. And so we did that for about six months. And then by the time the next security questionnaire came by, we were able to answer all of the questions and maybe a few things I had to go back to the developers and say, well, what about this? What about this? Okay. You know, and, and then some things there was maybe one item like, oh, they still had TLS 1.1 turned on. So we had to turn it off. So we got to the point where we did that. And then, you know, through the, through all this, we we're having some conversation. I said to them, you know what? I mean, if you have a SOC 2 type 2 uh, report, you can pro provide that and that'll get you past most security questionnaires. Um, or if you have like an ISO certification, which is, which is recognized more globally than, than the SOC 2. So, uh, so we did that and we actually, uh, because of the work and the due diligence we had done leading up to it, we got the ISO certification almost without trouble. And they are now going through their, their SOC 2 evaluation period and are, are on target to have it by the end of the year. This went from probably about a year and a half ago, a company that just, you know, I mean, it was a startup. They were just going 100 miles an hour, just doing what they do to put features in, put features in, put features in. And oh, by the way, now we have to grow up and, you know, put in proper security controls along the way. And the challenge there was we couldn't just jam everything in at once. We had to prioritize and do it alongside of all the other things that we were doing. And, and now they're in, a, they're in a place where they'll be able to go to these larger companies and not have to hold their breath to see if they pass a security audit. Uh, 
All right. There we go. Yeah. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about what we do in a virtual CISO engagement. And this can be, you know, if there's any aspiring CISOs out there or even, um, you know, someone who is wearing that security hat, uh, this is a great approach to just kind of get from, we don't know what we don't know to uh, how do we have a good security program in place. So the first thing we do uh, is we, we do the scope and baseline. And, and what that means is the first thing I do when I'm starting as, as a VC, so is I want to know the business. I want to know what is it, what is it you guys do? Um, is, and what's, what's important for the business? Because again, there is no such thing as security risk. There's only business risk. And if we make decisions without regard to the impact on the business, then, then we're making those decisions in a silo. So in order to be successful, I need to know what are the keys to success for the business? And then what are the contexts that the business is operating in? Are you just in Canada? Are you in the Canada US? Are you global? Do you have regulatory requirements? Do you have contractual requirements? Um, what are the threats that this business is seeing? You know, are you, if you're in the oil and gas industry, we need to focus obviously on keeping, keeping the oil and gas going. If you're in healthcare, we need to focus on not only protecting uh, health information, but also making sure health information is available to the right people at the right time. You really need to understand the business that you're in in order to be successful as a CISO. And then once you understand the business, it's like, okay, what are the critical assets? What are the things that, whether it's information or technology assets or even physical assets, what are the things that if these things are compromised impacts the business? And then once you've, once you've identified those, those assets, then you can kind of go to phase two, which is the risk assessment. So we know there are these assets. It's like, okay, now we go through that security risk assessment. Uh, what are the threats? Where are your vulnerabilities? What are your security controls? And therefore, uh, where are we in terms of risk? And then once you have the risk assessment, you can develop a roadmap. You say, okay, while we're here right now, we need to get to here. How do we get from A to B? And, and that's where we start to get into that operational aspect of things. But until you do those first two phases, you, you're, really, you're really just, just uh, flying in the wind. Like you really don't have a direction of where you're going. And also you need to be able to communicate this again to the board and to the executives. You need to help them understand that we're here and we have this risk and we need to get to here. And here's how we get there. And that's how you get board level support. In healthcare, I, I, always, I always joke that, you know, you've got two people asking the CFO for money. You've got the doctor and the security person. I know it sounds like a bad joke, but uh, the doctor is saying, okay, you know, we could spend this million dollars on buying this medical device and saving people's lives. And then you've got the security person saying, we could spend this million dollars on this monitoring system that will help us detect uh, if hackers are in our system. Well, who's getting that million dollars? Uh, you know, no CFO is, is going to say, well, I don't want to save lives. Uh, it, the doctor will always win that bet. So what's important is that uh, you're at least helping the CFO make an informed decision. And I mean, that's, that's a little bit of a false choice. It's not always do we spend it here or there, but it is important that we're able to put this in terms that they can understand and be able to say, okay, for our business, here's, here's the decision we want to make. And maybe their decision is to accept a certain level of risk but then it's their decision. It's not the security or the IT person's decision. It's their decision to accept the risk and they're making it with eyes wide open. So one thing that um, a CISO will often do is um, is aligned with, with a framework. You know, we, we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time we do something. We want to use a tried, true, proven approach to things. So one thing we look at is either, you know, IT risk management, enterprise security risk management cycle. Uh, and with a lot of organizations, you know, based on ISO 27001 uh, standards, uh, which is, you know, a globally accepted uh, uh, standard for information security. 
<clears throat> so what, what we'll do as part of this is kind of follow that process that I outlined earlier. You know, we'll start with the business and understand what the business does. We'll move to what are the business assets? Uh, and therefore, what are the risks to those assets? And what are the options and mitigations? And, and options are, like I said, either, either mitigate the risk, um, accept the risk, or sometimes it's transfer the risk. Maybe it's outsource a certain function. Uh, maybe it's um, purchase cyber liability insurance or, you know, some, some other way to address the risk uh, rather than if, if it doesn't make business sense to mitigate it. But what's important is that that decision is made very thoughtfully and by the right people. So when we're calculating risk, again, it's what are the threats? And let's take the common example, ransomware. You know, everyone is being attacked by ransomware right now. So if you look at the likelihood of the threat occurring, boom, right up at the top for just about everyone. For other types of risks, you know, maybe there's varying levels. Um, uh, lost laptops is a type of, of um, threat. Now that everyone is remote with their laptops, that likelihood can go higher. Um, if organizations don't have laptops or their laptops don't travel, you know, that risk is lower. So you have to look at the different threat scenarios to be able to focus on, um, on the right threats. And then once that occurs, again, uh, looking at the, well, let's, let's talk about the laptops. Um, what's the likelihood of that causing an impact? So is there any confidential information on that laptop? Uh, maybe in, you know, in healthcare, maybe there's, there's, uh, maybe there's patient information on it. Now you have a breach of patient information. Maybe it's a salesperson who doesn't handle a lot of confidential information. Now your, your impact is a lot lower. And if you take those two things together um, and also consider the security controls in your likelihood equations, that produces your risk. So, um, you know, what's likely that someone's gonna lose a laptop? What's the impact if it happens? That determines if it's high or low risk, it might determine if you wanna go ahead and encrypt those laptops or put other security controls in place. So once we have that, again, the risk decisions are determined by the asset owner and often the business owner, not by IT or even cybersecurity. These are business risks. That's where the risk decision needs to be made, whether to accept, reduce, avoid, or transfer. <clears throat> So what we do in our engagements is once we do that, we can put these things in a format that um, the board and the CEO, the CFO, those people can understand. Here's kind of a spider map of a security control assessment result. So we've got the different areas of security controls, the level of maturity for each, and a score. Now this is not risk-based, but this is another input into that decision-making process. So we can see here that our organizational asset management and personnel security are pretty low and we need to work on those. Um, enterprise security risk management uh, also shows at, at, at a zero. So you can see the blue line is kind of where we're at right now. The, the green is, we'll give it a pass. We want to get to the red and um, the orange or yellow is, is optimal. You actually usually don't, don't get that far but we wanna at least kind of get to the green line. So any that fall below there, we wanna say, you know what, we need to focus on these areas and it really helps you prioritize your efforts. And again, this is just a, another kind of representation of similar information, but what this does show is that someone who is, um, who has experience in this type of process uh, and this type of um, material can actually take the, take the results of the assessment and put them into terms that the business can understand and make educated business decisions on. <clears throat> so yeah, how does, the question came up, how does an, an organization transfer risk? Um, from my perspective, the risk still belongs to the company. You, it, it's true. I mean, <laughs> it, it is absolutely true. And so you have to kind of clarify when you say transfer risk. Um, it, it really means that you still own it, but you are, you are transferring the, the implementation of the, the safeguard to someone else. So that's where I say outsourcing. 
so for example, uh, let's take uh, PCI as an example. So we don't want the risk of handling credit card information in our company. We don't believe we have sufficient, uh, or we don't believe it makes sense for us to spend all this money trying to protect these credit cards in our organization um, because what we, we, we want to focus on our business and that's, that's not what we do. The credit card is just the payment stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, hire a third party uh, payment company and they'll do all the payments. We never see a credit card and they, they do this day in and day out. Um, you know, they, they have the controls in place, the PCI compliance. Uh, we never want to see a credit card because we don't want to incur that risk. Now, that credit card information is still your risk or it's still your critical asset and a breach at your vendor is still your breach as we mentioned before but now it becomes a vendor management play it it becomes they're they're responsible for protecting it and if they do breach it we may be able to actually go after them uh, if they're shown as non-compliant or out of out of uh, contractual uh, agreements so that's that's when I say transfer risk. That's that's what I mean. It's still your risk, but it it changes it changes a lot of the risk equation. I hope that answers your question. And finally, uh, what we hope to get to is um, this uh, remediation roadmap. So we've done all this work, and now we can say, okay, here's the roadmap. Here are the things we need to work on. Here are the things that are bright red and you know, should be drawing your eyes toward them. Here are the things that we've addressed in our green. And this can also help show, okay, here are the things we've accomplished. You know, what have you done for me lately? Well, we implemented security awareness training. We did a tabletop exercise. We implemented a, a proper business continuity plan and all these things. But oh, by the way, we still need to do these, these other things over here. And we're able to represent that uh, in a way that hopefully most people can understand. So I hope we have a little bit of time for questions here, um, but just kind of to wrap it up, uh, we really want to avoid that pitfall of assigning information security responsibilities in the wrong place. It may be possible that your IT manager is also, uh, you know, has CISSP has his, his great security expertise and can do all this stuff and be an IT manager. Um, a lot of times I see that's not the case. Um, <clears throat> If you are going to hire a CISO, hire someone that can bridge that gap between the technology and the business. It's not always the best technical person that's the best CISO. It's the person that can, uh, you know, know what what needs to be done and be able to and know where his limits are or her limits, and tap that that person on the shoulder where we need to augment. And uh, just to mention, a VC so it can be a very cost effective way to achieve these goals and and not break the bank. So that's all I've got today. Um, there are no open questions, but I'll, I'll leave a minute or two for, for people to put uh, additional questions in there. So um, thank you, Adam. I guess we are out of time. And while I'm doing so... that, maybe I'll take a drink of water.